I am very happy you're all here because this is an amazing text of scripture that we have today. It is one of the most famous parables that Jesus ever spoke, perhaps even his most famous, the prodigal son. It's one of the most famous, famous passages in the whole Bible. It is the longest parable that Jesus spoke. It's very rich. And the problem oftentimes is that when this is usually preached, it's taken completely out of context. Um, and the main emphasis is usually made the forgiveness of God when the Father forgives the Son. And for sure, that is a very good thing, and that is an important element of the parable. But we need to remember the context. What was that? Why did Jesus speak this parable? Uh, if you recall in verses 1 and 2, because verses 1 and 2 give us uh, the introduction to this whole chapter, uh, it says this, look at verse 1, it says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. That's what we've been looking at for the past couple of weeks. And that's the context. Jesus, Jesus then goes on to give two small parables about the lost sheep and the lost coin that we looked at last week. And the whole point was that God rejoices over the fact that lost sinners come to repentance. And so this is basically the same lesson again, where Jesus is talking about, you know, Pharisees are complaining, why is Jesus eating with sinners? And Jesus says, because that's what I do. I save sinners. And God rejoices over that. And at the end of the parable, where the older brother is introduced, he is actually a picture of the Pharisees who are complaining about Jesus as the older brother comes and complains because the father is rejoicing over the younger son who's come back. Just giving you a quick roundabout of the whole parable. So, keep in mind as we go through this that Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees who are complaining that he is hanging out with sinners. So let's start this marvelous parable, verse 11. Then he said, that's Jesus, a certain man had two sons. Very simple. Verse 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Now, if you were the Pharisees listening to this, you would be like, what? You would be pulling your hair out. You're like, what? What, what, what happened? Yeah, we need to understand what's going on here. Because this is very important. Um, remember uh, that in Israel at that time, there are specific laws given by God, in fact, about how inheritance is supposed to be divided. And, you know, if a man died and he had sons, um, his inheritance would have to go to his sons. The older of the sons would get a double portion because he was the firstborn. So if you have two sons, as this guy does, you would divide the inheritance into three parts. Two of them, two thirds would go to the older brother because he's the firstborn. One third would go to the younger brother. Right? And so, uh, while that's all good and understandable, that's actually the law in Deuteronomy 21, what we need to understand here is that the younger brother comes and asks for this. His father is not dead. He comes to him and he says, what you're supposed to give me when you die, I want it now. And this is the, this is the livelihood of his father. His father's not dead. He still needs his stuff. I mean, I can't, even today, I can't imagine going to my father and saying, um, Father, uh, I want a third of all your property now. What? Imagine back then, with the, the, the honor was the most important thing. The fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. This was like, this was essential to Jewish understanding. And so here comes this guy to his father and basically says, 
Father, best case scenario for my life would be if you were dead. But, since you're not dead, give me my stuff now and I'm leaving. This is, Jesus starts this story off, well, this is a big shock. You can imagine the Pharisees saying, this, you're expecting the Father right now to slap him in the face, dishonor him, uh, disown him, how dare you say such a thing? But here's the second shock. The end, the end of verse 12. So he, that's the father, so he divided to them his livelihood. He did it. He said, okay. He divides everything he has, whether it's land or uh, cattle or houses, money, whatever. He divides everything and he gives this one third to his son. Now, verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. It says, not many days later. So he didn't wait long. He took everything. I guess he turned it into cash, sold it, whatever. Takes it, leaves. And he goes to a far country. So he's not in Israel anymore. He's left some Gentile land. And this is, I was thinking, there are so many people in the world, so many people in the world, who treat God the exact same way as this guy treats his father. I love the stuff that God gives me. I'm glad that I have money. I'm glad that I have health. I'm glad that I have friends, family, uh, I enjoy sports, I enjoy music, I enjoy food, I enjoy all these things, which are good things indeed. They're given by God. These are good things. James chapter 1 says, all good gifts come from above, from the Father of lights. But what they do is, they want all the stuff, but I want nothing to do with God himself. I'll appreciate all the stuff that he gives me. Well, not really appreciate. I'll take the stuff that he gives me, but I'm not going to have anything to do with him. Just like, the old, just like the younger son here. I'm taking the stuff that's my father's and I'm leaving. I don't love him. I love the stuff. It kind of reminds me of Romans chapter 1 where it says that though people knew God, they didn't worship God. They, did, they weren't thankful to him. They suppressed the truth of God that they have. And instead they worshipped the creature rather than the creator who is Blessed over all. They worship the stuff. They worship the gifts rather than the giver who gave it to them. That's what this guy does. It's idolatry, basically. So it says that he wastes everything. He has all the money, but he wastes it by prodigal living. Greek word is asotos. Meaning it's just, he, it's just reckless. It's wild. He just... It's, he's not thinking. He just wastes it all. Scatters it in the Greek. So, he's got nothing left. Verse 14. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Now, spending everything was his fault. That was a big mistake. Now, if famine hits, that's not his fault. But it happens. That's life. Bad things happen. And so, you know, if, if he was just poor, because he's lost everything, maybe someone could help him. But if there's a famine, no one has anything to eat. Even if I wanted to give you something, I don't have anything. I myself am looking for food. I can't give you any food. I need to survive myself. So now we're getting really low. So he says, okay, this is no good. I've got no money. I've got no food. I've got no friends. I've got no nothing. I need to pick myself up. What am I going to do? I'm going to get a job. Verse 15. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Again, if you're the Jewish person reading this, you're like, what? No! The swine, the most unclean animal, even if it wasn't unclean, even if God hadn't proclaimed it to be unclean, which he had, the, just a pig alone is a disgusting animal. It's filthy. And so, 
this guy, it says he, it says he joined himself, the Greek word is ekolithi, means he stuck. He stuck, he latched onto a guy who was a citizen there. So this is kind of, I'm starting to think that this is kind of like, he's kind of become like a beggar now. That latches onto someone, I, I got nothing, I need something. And this guy doesn't know what to do with him, so he sends him off into the fields to feed pigs. But he's not ready to go home yet. Verse 16. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. So he is lowest of the low. This is how low you can get. This is, this, is, this is the end right here. No money, no friends, no food, no house. And he's envious of the pigs because they've got a bunch of junk to eat. He wish, he's wishing that he was a pig so he could eat junk. A lot of people would despair at this situation. Some people may even commit suicide at this situation when there is no prospects, no nothing. There is nothing left. But, verse, but then something happens. Something changes. Verse 17, everything changes. But when he came to himself... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I love the fact that it says, when he came to himself. This right here is the moment of repentance. This is when everything changes. You see, what does repentance mean? Greek word metania. What does it mean? Meta means after. Nia comes from nous, which means mind. Metania means basically to change your mind. To rethink things. To think, you know what? The way that I used to think, that's, that's, not, that's not right. I turn. I convert. I go the other way. That's what repentance is. And he comes to himself. He has a change of mind. He starts thinking reasonably for the first time. He starts thinking rationally. He says, this isn't working out for me. And the, the, the thing is, sin is not reasonable. If you think about it, sin doesn't actually make any sense to say, okay, there's a God, He's holy, He punishes sinners, but I'm going to go ahead and sin anyway. That doesn't make sense. Sin doesn't make sense. But we all do it. And so this guy finally starts thinking reasonably, rationally. He comes to himself and he, he has an honest assessment of his life. And he says, you know what, if I continue this way, I'm going to die. That's what he says. If I continue this way, I'm going to die. And he thinks of his father. His father is a kind man, is a good man who... Even his servants have much to eat. So, he says, okay, what are we going to do? Verse 18. He says, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. That's what I'm going to do. Now the Pharisees listening to this must be thinking, okay, finally, some reason, good for you. Okay, young man, this is, this is, you're, you're thinking sensibly now. That's the only way that you can be restored to your father. Go back, apologize. Now this may take some time. He may not accept, I mean, he may not accept you at all, but if he does, what you've got to do is become like one of his hired servants and work. Work to gain his approval. And maybe ten years down the road, if you've worked enough, if you have um, gained back all the stuff that you lost, maybe he'll forgive you, maybe you can be his son again. Okay, you're thinking right. Go ahead, do it. Alright. So, verse 20. 
And he arose and came to his father. So he's on his way. He's walking back. And he may be thinking, which is quite reasonable. He may be thinking, you know, I, I don't know if my father is going to accept me after what I did. Dishonored him in such a way. Took all his stuff, wasted it. I don't deserve this, but, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to ask. We'll see what happens. You know, at this time, what would probably happen would be that he would go back. His father may not even come out to see him. Maybe just leave him out there. And the whole village can see him. And the whole village can mock him and spit on him and disgrace him for what he has done to his father and bring dishonor. And he's thinking, I'm probably going to have to go through all that. We're going to see what happens. So he goes. Then, in the middle of verse 20, it says, But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. How come his father saw him? I mean, he's far away. He's still a great way off. His father sees him. I don't know. It doesn't. Either his father just happened by chance that day to be staring at the horizon and he sees his son. Or maybe he would go out every day waiting to see if his son would come back. I don't know. It doesn't say. But his father sees him far away coming. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? Verse 21 I'm sorry, verse 20. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put the ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. It says his father runs his father runs as soon as he sees him. Now I want you to understand now. This is an older man. This is a noble man. They don't run. They got servants to do stuff for them. Especially at that time, you know, you got the robe. You got to pull it up. Your legs are exposed. You're running like this, like a little girl. It's, 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 it's not that, uh, how can we, it's not that dignified. It's shameful, in fact. The Pharisees are probably thinking, what? But sometimes you're so happy that you cannot contain yourself. And so he runs, and he hugs him, and he kisses him. That's not strong enough, by the way, in the English. The Greek word is not philao, it's kataphilao, which means just covers him with kisses. Because his son is back. And so at this point, the son decides to speak. And he, remember, he had three things that he was going to say to his father. Number one was, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Two, I am not worthy to be called your son. Three, make me one of your hired servants. What does he say here? Verse 21, And the son sent him, One, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Two, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Three, he doesn't even get to say it. His father won't even let him. Father interrupts. You're not a servant. You're my son. And this is what he says. Bring a robe. Bring a ring. Bring sandals. Dress him up. This is my son. He's back. Not only that. Let's kill the fattened calf. You know, they'd have a calf there. Especially amongst all the calves that they had. And they'd feed it real good every day. So it was big and fat. And on really special occasions. Like the once every few years. They kill this for a really special occasion, and this was the special occasion. He says, my son was dead, and now he's alive. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that 
all of us were dead in trespasses and sins. Not just sick in need of medicine, we were dead in need of resurrection from the dead. And it's Christ who gives us life. Now, a lot of people looking at this right here may think, that's not fair. This isn't fair. This man doesn't deserve any of this. He doesn't. He dishonored his father, wasted his goods, and now his father treats him like this. That's not right. He doesn't deserve any of this. I know. He doesn't. That's the point. That's why we call it grace. This is the grace of God. No one deserves it. No one deserves to be saved. No one deserves to be taken to heaven. No one deserves blessings from God when we've all sinned against Him. But He does it. And the thing is, so many people don't see themselves that way. They don't see themselves as sinners. They see themselves as righteous. I am good. How many times have you heard people say, I'm a good person. Why do these things happen to me? <laughs> I'm good. I'm righteous. I deserve all the good stuff. This guy was a bad guy. He doesn't deserve good stuff. I'm the good guy. I deserve the good stuff. That's how the Pharisees thought. That's how a lot of people think. And that's how the big brother thought. Who represents the Pharisees. And you know, if the story ended right here, it would be great. It would be like the two previous parables that ended with rejoicing. You know, I found the sheep, rejoicing. I found the coin, rejoicing. The brother is back, rejoicing. But, sadly, there's a sad end to this. Verse 25. Now his oldest son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. That's weird. What's going on? I'm the main heir of all of this and all kinds of stuff is going on without my permission. What's going on here? So he's suspicious. Verse 26. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Now at this point, the brother should have rejoiced with everyone else and gone in. But remember, the, remember verse 1? You got Pharisees and some people are partying. Why are they partying? Who's there? Oh, it's Jesus and tax collectors and sinners. And they're partying together. And the Pharisees say, what? How dare he do such a thing? And here you have the older brother. He hears partying. What's going on? Oh, it's your brother who's come back, and your father's holding a party. What? How dare he do such a thing? How dare he throw a party for this young man who wasted all our goods? Verse 28. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. <laughs> his father is just like the nicest guy in the world. He, he is trying to make reconciliation with everyone. Look at this. Verse 29. So he answered and said to his, to his father, Look! I know it says lo in your translations, but no one talks like that anymore. He says, look! And that itself on its own would be shocking to the people who are hearing. Because uh, remember, this, remember this, is, this older brother, he is he's a respected man in his community. He's the person who never did anything wrong. He's the nice guy. He's the hard worker who uh, respects his father, supposedly. And this is a respected person in the community. But here now, you will see all his true colors coming out. So he doesn't address his father as father. He says to him, look here. Look, these many years I have been serving you. By the way, bad translation. The Greek word, which is dulevo, which today we use as work, back then does not mean that. It means slaving. All these years I have been slaving for you. So you're like, oh, so all this time 
He hasn't been viewing this as a loving father-son relationship. He's been feeling like his father was a slave master and I've been slaving for you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Oh, here he is. This is Mr. Perfect right there. I've never done anything wrong. And yet, you, it's the father's fault. You see, he, he's not upset with the brother so much. The brother did what he did. I mean, if you think about it, listen. The, the younger brother and the older brother are not that different in the sense that neither one of them really loved their father. In the beginning, at least, the younger brother didn't love his father. Now he does. But neither one of them really loved their father. They just wanted the inheritance. And so, um, you know, at least the, youngest, the younger brother had the guts to say, I don't like you, I want the money, and I'm leaving. This guy thought, you know, that's probably not the best idea to get my inheritance. I mean, I'm going to get a lot of stuff anyway, so I'm just going to try and work it, seem like the good guy, and at some point the old man will die and I'll get it. But now, he is so upset with his father, because he's not upset with the, old, the younger brother. The younger brother did what he did. But he's upset with his father because he's saying his father is not doing what's right. How dare you would forgive him? How dare you would receive him back? You're not thinking right. That's what he says. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, he doesn't even call him his brother, as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. This is how self-righteous people are. They say there's two kinds of people in the world. There's good people and there's bad people. I'm, I'm part of the good people and I deserve all the good stuff. And then there are bad people and they deserve all the bad stuff. They don't understand forgiveness or anything like that. And... Uh, you tell people, you explain to people the gospel that God forgives. And I've heard people say to me, are you telling me that if, if Hitler repented of his sins and trusted in Christ that God would forgive him? I'm never going to believe in a God like that. That's not right. You see, because Hitler is one of the bad people. They deserve hell. They deserve bad stuff. But me, I'm one of the good people, you see. I deserve good stuff, just like this brother. You're forgiving him. I, I deserve all the good stuff. Romans 3 says that on your own, no one is righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, the only way that anyone can be righteous is if they trust in Christ, and Christ's perfect righteousness is given to you through faith. Hebrews, Hebrews 11, I want, I, want you to, I want you to really understand this. Hebrews 11 teaches that, says, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible, not improbable, not hard. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In fact, Romans 14 says that anything that is not of faith is sin. So let's think about this. If without faith you cannot please God, and everything, then everything that you do, anything that you have ever done, is sin. And only sin. And you may say, no, 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 Nico, that's impossible. Come on. I mean, uh, there are so many people who do good stuff all the time. Well, maybe socially speaking, morally speaking, but they're not doing it according to the Word of God. They're not doing it for the right reasons. They're, they're, they're not doing what they're doing for the glory of God. They're doing it for the glory of man. And so everything that they do since it is not from a heart that trusts in God, but it is for your whatever other motive they may be, and so everything that they do is polluted with sin. And it's not acceptable. The only way to be right with God is to be like the younger son. Everyone is a sinner. The, older, the younger brother was a sinner, 
The older brother was a sinner. Both were sinners. And the way to be right with God is not a pretended, oh, I'm the best guy in the world like the older brother. It's to be like the younger brother. Admit that you are a sinner. Go to the father. I am not worthy to be your son. Forgive me. Forgive me. I have sinned. No excuses. I have sinned. And that is the one who is forgiven. Not the older one. Well, let's finish this passage with the kind words of the Father. Verse 31. And he said to him, Son, that actually, that's, again, that's not the best translation. It's child. Technon. Child, you're always with me. And all that I have is yours. Certainly, that's the case. I mean, the two-thirds that are left, they belong to the older son. All that I have is yours. Verse 32, it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Same thing that he said before to the servants. And uh, we don't, the story ends kind of abruptly here, just kind of, that's it. Your son, your brother was lost and he is found. He was dead and he's alive again. And the sad thing here is that even though the story ends, we know that in, in this parable, the younger brother represented the tax collectors and the sinners and the older brother represented the Pharisees. And the sad thing is that when the Pharisees heard this, they didn't say, you know, Jesus, you're right. We, we are so dumb. We are so self-righteous. We repent. We're going to come in and eat with you and the sinners and the tax collectors. We're sorry we were so self-righteous. But they don't do that. They do not repent. And in fact, not too long from now, they continue hating Jesus and they kill him. Because they won't accept this. They will not accept this kind of God who forgives sinners got to work for it and earn it according to their thinking but let's close on a more joyous note <laughs> the good news is that even though the Pharisees hated him and even though they were self-righteous and did not believe in him Jesus remains a loving and forgiving and merciful God 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, just like the older brother, the younger brother, excuse me, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's our God. Let's pray.